work with Azure Data Studio. So yeah, uh, just a little bit, just enough to get that shirt, right? Enough to get this shirt. All right. So I'm Dave Bland. This is actually my second time here this year. I think it was in May or something like that earlier this year. Uh, this is how you can get in contact with me. Uh, that's my Twitter account. Um, although next year I'm pretty much going to make fun of the Brewers. Um, for, um, because he, Jake posts a bunch of pictures of him at Brewers games, so I'm going to post a bunch of pictures of me at Cubs games. Um, and there's my blog, and just so you know, I've done, I think, 21 blog posts on Azure Data Studio with over the last few months. Um, so if you want additional information, go there. There's a hole on the menu side on the left-hand side. Just click Azure Data Studio, and they're listed out there. Um, what about me? Um, I am... I've, Got ready to publish my 59th blog post this year. So I've been doing a lot of that. Um, I do a lot of SQL Saturdays. I did 14 of them this year. This is my ninth user group. Um, so I, I do quite a few of those. Um, the SQL Saturdays were in 13 states. Um, and those are, I like this, this is a Power BI thing. So if you're into analytics, somebody got access into the SQL Saturday stuff, and this is a Power BI presentation. That's all the SQL Saturdays I've been to. What's interesting is like in Iowa, See, the pies got different colors. Apparently, I did presentations in languages I don't know. <laughs> so I'm really not sure how that happened. Um, but you notice there's a big dot there right over medicine. What was that? Uh, no, I think one's Chinese or I don't know what they are. But uh, um, you know, it's the big dot right over Madison there. But you go a little further north, a bigger dot over Wausau because I've done seven presentations up there in two <laughs> SQL Saturdays. Um, I've, uh, I'm a friend, friend of the Redgate program. I've been a DBA for 16 years, but during that time I've done a lot of BI development, a lot of reporting development, as well as application development using db.net. I've been teaching SQL Server for 20 years, uh, almost 21. I've been a Microsoft certified trainer, and I, if you have nothing else to do on Monday and Wednesday nights, feel free to drive all the way down to the north suburbs of Chicago on Monday and Wednesday nights, um, I teach the Microsoft Certified Courses and SQL Server, and currently the manager of the DBA team at Stereocycle. So what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about what is Azure Data Studio, um, and then we're going to talk about how to create connections, execution plans. One of the things with Azure Data Studio, it works much differently than what we're used to in Management Studio. You got to go through things just a little bit different route, and you got to install some things, because Azure Data Studio is kind of a shell. And in that shell, people bring in these extensions that you could create if you wanted to. Um, you, can, you just got to get all the software you need to develop. It's more of an open source thing. So it's very, very cool. I really like that. Uh, we're going to talk about notebooks, which I think is probably the coolest feature um, of Azure Data Studio. I remember, it, I think it was the SQL Saturday in Louisville. Um, somebody had done their presentation using notebooks, and everybody was talking about it. It is such a cool thing, and you'll see that. Um, how to install it, it's, it's a pretty straightforward install. Uh, running queries, some of the advantages that Azure Data Studio has over Management Studio. Uh, the use of extensions, and we're not going to get into workspaces unless we have a little bit of time at the end. Now, <clears throat> what is Azure Data Studio? The thing about it is it's an open source tool that where people can create these extensions that can bring in whatever functionality you want into it. And some of the, we'll get more in detail into some of these a little bit later. Um, but the name, I think, is a little confusing because it has Azure in it. And I was talking to somebody the other day. It's like, I didn't know we could use it for on-prem SQL servers. And you absolutely can. It doesn't, you don't even have to ever touch Azure. It's just got the name on it, right? Um, and some of the functionality, it's not native within Azure Data Studio. It's actually in the extensions that you will install on your computer. There's dashboards there, but you can bring PowerShell into this as well, which is very, very cool. So now you don't need to jump into the PowerShell console. You can do everything right here. Um, but most importantly, I think it's that last one. You can install on multiple OSs. You can install this on the Apple OS. So if you have an Apple computer that you work with, you can put this on there. Um, and I think that's huge. You can actually install it on Linux as well. Um, and that's a big movement from Management Studio, which you can only install on Windows. So what should I use Management Studio versus Azure Data Studio? Well, one of the things I, I did is I, when I was out at Summit, 
uh, two weeks ago is I sat in one of the focus groups for Azure Data Studio and somebody asked uh, a question related, it's more of Management Studio versus Azure Data Studio. And the answer was, don't consider them competitors, consider them sisters, right? You really should have them both installed. Um, I'm sure maybe Azure Data Studio at some point may, years down the road, might evolve and mature to the point where uh, it can replace it. But Management Studio's you got so much functionality, it may take a while to do that. Um, and some of the things that if you want to do it is one is um, if you want to do importing and exporting using backpacks, if you want to use registered servers, if you want to work with Query Store, some of the performance tuning stuff is available in Management Studio, but not available inside Azure Data Studio. Um, and if you want to get deep into the administrative side of things, Azure Data Studio is not really where you want to go for that. It's more of Management Studio. Now, what if you want to use, when would you use Azure Data Studio? Well, if you have an Apple computer, a Mac, or you have a Linux, you can install it on there. If you're connecting to a SQL Server 2019 big data cluster, um, it has a lot of functionality on that. Um, if you just simply work like a, a, an analyst where you just simply run queries all the time, right? There's some functionality there. It's going to be very, very helpful. Um, if you need to visualize your data, there's a, a, an extension inside Azure Data Studio. It makes it really easy to visualize your, your data right inside this tool. You don't need to go to Power BI, which is a great tool, but you don't have to go to it. I just want a real quick, dirty visualization of my data. I can do it right here, right? Um, you don't need to use wizards or anything like that. Um, and I've talked about the administrative configurations. So what you really want is you want them both installed. So you have them installed. Later on, we're going to get into the extensions. And that's where the meat of Azure Data Studio really is, is in those extensions. And we're going to talk about a few of those. All right? Now, <clears throat> when you go to install Azure Data Studio, one of the things you're going to encounter is a number of different things. And we're used to going to Management Studio options, right? And everything was there. But when you go here, it's a little bit different. And how many people are DBAs? Yeah, so we have a few. Work with JSON at all? Not, not much, right? Right. It, it just hasn't really gotten down to our area yet. You know, some areas that have. Well, to change some of these settings, you actually have to do it in JSON. Like, for example, these color tabs right here. If you want a tab color that's different than what's native within Azure Data Studio, you got to go into, into the JSON file and you got to modify it. Right, so what what will happen is that when you see a setting, it'll say edit in JSON, settings .json. and that's a file, and uh, you click that, it'll open up, and you have to go into that file and make the changes in there. Right, so if you're a DBA or if you're uh, any other role, you might want to take a look at JSON. There's a um, where's he from? Minnesota does some really nice sessions on JSON. Um, I can't remember his name. Uh, Jim. Oh, Jim Domi? Yeah. Do Domi, oh, something like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's got some really, really nice sessions on, on JSON as well. So you can go in there. And so when I come over here, and I got Management Studio open, and all I have to do is go to File, Preferences, Settings. And then you have all kinds of different settings. You can search. Oh, what happened? Oh, uh, that, yeah, you might have been, does that the PowerPoint? Yeah. Yeah, I think I can share. Maybe like extend or duplicate the knowledge. Let's see. It's coming through online. <laughs> Whatever screen you're sharing is. Yeah. Yeah, but it should be this. Okay. Oh, yeah, that would be good. And what should I do? So, if you take HTML, then you can present. Can you still see it online? Yep, I see your desktop. A boat. A big boat. Uh, my stepdaughter's on that ship. Uh, so, when we come here and you go to uh, File preferences, here's all your settings. You can still search, but you know, you have font size similar to what you have in Management Studio. But if you come to some of these, you're going to start to see as you get deeper on, you're going to start to see 
if I can find one. Um, let's see, data. Yeah, I can't find one, but you, here's one right here. So you click this, it opens up the JSON file, right? And then you can just edit it uh, to what you need. All right, so that's a, a little bit different than what we're used to, right? Uh, and I think, and I don't know for sure, but I'm thinking part of that is because the extensions are developed by a bunch of different people. And they really don't know what settings each extension is going to have. Uh, at Summit, I did a, a quick presentation on the Port SQL formatter extension. There's settings with that. There's some extensions that have absolutely nothing, right? So we'll talk about some of those. So this is a JSON file here. And if you look, <clears throat> the breadcrumbs across the top. Right, and this will give you the path of where it's at. But once you hit where it says JSON or settings.json, it's breaking me down into the hierarchy of the JSON file. And if we look, it says database display name. You notice right here, you can't see it because of that, but database display name. So when you click here, it'll bring it to there, right? And these red boxes I put on there so you can see it. So there's a very clear hierarchy into this. And I'm not a JSON expert. I won't pretend to be. Uh, I'm kind of more along the lines with you. I played with it a little bit, and, and that's about it. Um, but if you're going to work a lot in this, I would highly recommend you at least familiarize yourself with it um, because it's common. It's kind of like XML from a number of years ago um, and PowerShell as well. I've been telling people for 10 years, learn PowerShell, learn PowerShell. And the reason is is that you can't really survive hardly anymore without it. Right? So. When you first open up um, Azure Data Studio, this dashboard will pop up, and a couple things kind of jump out at you. One is you get new connection, open file, all that kind of stuff. But look at this right here. This came out with the release the Monday of Summit is when that came out. But there's another one here, down here, show welcome page on startup, right? So if you want to see this, check that. But if you don't see it, you can go into settings, you go workbench, startup editor, and it says welcome page. You can change that. So the reason I, I wanted to show this is deploy SQL Server is that when you click it, this is what you're going to get. And if you look at it, we can do a couple different things. One is you can install SQL Server into Windows. You can then work with containers, Kubernetes, that type of thing. And you can work with big data clusters. And this is for deployment. And so it's something really, really new. We couldn't really do that with Management Studio. Right now it's early on. And so when I click install SQL Server on Windows, it takes me to the web page for the evaluation copy. <laughs> right. So I'm still looking to see how to go about doing that. Um, if you go to container image and if you look down here, um, these are the requirements, the Kubernetes requirements, which I'm not an expert. I don't know a whole lot about it. Uh, but you notice two of them, one was installed, one's installing and the other one hasn't installed yet. And I will tell you, the second one installed, that one failed, right? So I don't know why, it just didn't work, right? So I like this part of the dashboard because it might make it a little easier for us to do some of these administrative tasks that we've had to do in the past. Um, now, <coughs> connections. Connections are something that we always have to work with, but one of the things that um, we can do now is we can go to now, other than SQL Server data sources like Postgres SQL. We can go to more destinations. We can go to Azure SQL Database. We can also go to a SQL Server instance. Remember, Azure is in the name of the product, but that doesn't mean you can't use it on-prem. You can use it on-prem, which is what I'm gonna do. So if you look here, and we go to Azure Data Studio, the connections and everything revolves around these buttons on the left-hand side. So if you click here, there's my connections. Now you can go in here and you can create the bars and you can create groupings and that kind of stuff. But down here, this is where my Azure SQL DBs are. So if I had a connection to that, I, it separates them for me, right? So I have groups now that I can work with. Yeah. Uh, I want to ask, are you able to query any Send me an email on that. I have not found how to connect via an ODBC connection, uh, but if you send me an email, I'll look for it and I'll send you a response. 
just a warning, it'll probably be a blog post too. <laughs> um, hey, yeah. Uh, just, just a reminder because we've got people online. We yeah. Keep the question. And oh, okay. Uh, the question was, can we also go to ODBC? And, and I'm really not sure about that. So he's going to send me an email and I'll get an answer. Now, if I could get the answer to you guys, then if you could disseminate it out to the folks. So that'll be good. So, not sure about that one either. Okay. That's enough questions that I don't know the answers to. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, can, if you can send me, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll check into that. All right. So I really like the fact that we can do the color thing. And we used to have to go into the settings of the connections and do all kinds of hoops. And there was what a Redgate tool where we could do the coloring and there's a couple other tools. But those cost money. Here, we could do it right here, right? And so one of the things, if we click right here, new connection, and over here, I can click a connection, I can set it up. But if I go to uh, server group, I can choose the group I am, and that will dictate the color that it's in. And where are the settings for the color? In the JSON settings file, right? Uh, so I can set up connections that way. It's actually a very cool thing. So I'm going to cancel this guy. Do you consider this to be like just looking at it? It really looks like the data, like the data people version of Visual Studio Code. That's exactly what you got to use to create an extension is Visual Studio Code. So you think that's how they're positioning it. To get I, Visual Studio Code. Obviously, I didn't write, write this, but I would, would not be surprised if that's exactly the case. When I went to that, um, the focus group, Visual Studio Code came up probably 20 times just during that one hour meeting. Um, so it is heavily involved in this. Um, so connections are, are obviously something that we're going to use a lot. We got to connect to the databases. Now, <clears throat> running SQL queries, this hasn't changed a great deal. They're still out there, but one of the things I used to like to use, Control Shift U, takes the word and capitalizes it, right? Uh, it's not there by default in Azure Data Studio. So, what you got to do is you got to go get the extension um, for keyboard shortcuts, and, and this will add it, right? Um, so just like in Management Studio, each tab is a separate connection. Now, one of the things is that if you do SPHU2, AZ Data Object Explorer is what you'll see as the program for SPHU2. Whereas we used to see Management Studio there, you'll see that instead. Now, you can export results, CSV, Excel, and this right here, JSON, XML. And the, the picture's in the way. But if you look, when you run a query, these are what we can export it as. So you click that button, it'll take the contents and export it. These are for data visualizations, and we'll get a little into that. So I really, really like that. So if I come over here to run a query, there's a minimize button. Is there? Is it right here? There you go. Ah, there we go. Get rid of that. So we want to come here and do, 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 do. just a real simple demo, right? Real simple query. So if I look here, I click connect. It's going to ask me to connect. I'm going to come down here. I'm going to click connect. And now I can slip run. Now, one of the things that you'll see pop up, hopefully, and you did because it must have got turned off, is I still see the messages, I still see the results, but if I look over here into the right side, see those buttons there? I can click, like if I wanted to send it to an uh, XML file, mm -hmm. I can click that and it'll take me right to there. I don't, don't need to run through the export wizard, I don't need to do any of that kind of stuff. I really, really like that um, because it makes it easier. It's just less hops that I need to do to get the data I need. Is it the query or the results? The results. The results, right? Uh, it saves the headers, but you can, if you select all this, you can still export right here, copy with headers. Because you probably do what I do, copy with headers, paste in Excel. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you still can do that. Yeah, or I could simply come over here. Export as a CSV file or an Excel file, just go straight though. 
I, I do that export that copy and paste a lot uh, into Excel. All right. So now, um, so we'll get a little more into this, but I can change connections. I can run cancel. That's really no different. We've had all those before. So what's kind of new is the, the safe options. No, they actually all go to the same one. <laughs> actually, there's two servers they go to. I just did them different, differently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And one of the things that all Azure Data Studio will do is watch this. Close it. Now let's open it again. Notice it had it saved everything. I actually did a blog post about that. Um, it will open and remember everything you had open, including the changes in a file, up to if I select a file, a part of the file, and because people are watching today, it probably will fail, <laughs> and I close it. <clears throat> still selected. And, but it doesn't modify, if you make a change here, it remembers what changes you made, but it does not modify the actual file until you save it, right? Yeah. When you uh, close the studio, does it actually close the connection? Or does it keep, like, or, or does it No, it, it, because the app, it's just like Management Studio, when you close it, it'll close it out. That, that doesn't change, right? I like the saving part, right? Uh, because, and you can turn it off, go into settings, you can turn it off. I just struggle to find a reason why you would want to do that. Especially, I mean, come on, it saves what you selected. <laughs> That's, that in itself is kind of cool. All right. Um, so that's the queries. Now, <clears throat> the next thing is execution plans. Now, in execution plans in management studio, we had to go to the query menu, display ex estimated execution plan, or we could include ex actual execution plan. Here, it's a little bit different, right? And so you can still see the top operators and to get the actual, it's a little bit different, you gotta go control M shortcut in order to get it. Now, Century One does have their plan explorer as an extension inside Azure Data Studio. It's got a lot of the same features, but not all of them, right? So if I come over here to Azure Data Studio, and I got to double check and make sure why it didn't see it turned on. So if I click the explain button, and I did a blog post on this, if I click the explain button, it's going to ask for me to connect. And I hit connect. There's my plan, right? So it's still there. That's your estimated plan. Do you notice what just popped up? Century One Plan Explorer. Right, and if you want to turn that off, you can just simply come down here and you can toggle it on and off there, down in the corner. It's an extension you need to install. So I like this, but one of the things I really like is that it doesn't give me the plan right away. What it does do is it gives me a choice of what do I want to see it as. Do I want to see it as the XML representation or do I want to see it as the graphical representation? Because there's some things in the XML that you can't see in the graphics. Right, so sometimes you gotta dig in through there, uh, like the, uh, you do, you talk about deadlocks. You know, some of the detail on deadlocks, you can't get there, you gotta go into the XML uh, to do that. And so in fact, I, when I sat in your session in Iowa, I actually did a blog post afterwards on something you said. It was the frequency of the checks. I went and I, I went, oh, I got to learn more about that. So I researched it and did a blog post. I'm glad I could help you out. There. And you did. I really <laughs> appreciate that. Um, so then I click this and it just opens up. Now it's got this classic SQL Century 1 um, look to it. It's got the, the red, it's got the clustered index. So it's really no different. Um, and you float over it, you still got the same information, right? So it's a very, very nice tool. It's still there. It's just a little bit different, but what I really like about it, same tool. I don't have to go into a separate program to, to get access it, right? So I really, really like that. And, and if the second plan popping up, second tab pops up, you just come down here and you can turn it off, right? And we'll talk more about that in a little bit. So execution plans, you can go to explain, but you can also do control M. And the, if I float here, you notice it says estimated. Right, and if I go Control M, 
and open this up. But if I come back over here, now notice it's the actual execution plan now. But now I got it twice. I got it once here, and then I also have it in the Century One tab as well. So now I can look at the two sides of it. So execution plans is still part of Azure Data Studio. It's just slightly different, right? And one of the things you can do is, I like to do this, right click, save plan, right click, save plan, right click, save plan, right click, save plan, not an option, right? So what you can do is this, I'm gonna run this, and wait for it to pop up, and it's not popping up, and there, oh, there now pops up. So I come over here, what I can do is, there is an extension all called Paste the Plan. What it does is it grabs this and simply pastes it into Brent Ozar's site where he takes the XML and spits out a plan. Uh, that's all it does, right? It's just a little connector into his site, uh, which is kind of cool. I like it. Or you can copy and paste, do the same thing there, right? Um, So that's execution plans. Next thing is what are extensions? Now, um, basically it's things that are in Azure Data Studio or that you can do with Azure Data Studio that don't come with it natively, like the Century One Plan Explorer. That doesn't come with it. You gotta actually go and get the extension for that. Now, who creates these? A lot of different people. Being a friend of Redgates, I'm gonna say third parties like Redgate. You know, they have um, a couple of tools that are available, um, but also <clears throat> um, the community. That's the big thing, right? We, we got a lot of great companies, Redgate, Idera, Century One, that do some really cool things with their tools, but man, there's some cool stuff happening in the community as well. So there's some stuff out there that uh, people, because there's thousands and thousands and thousands of them, and the part I like about it, they give it away. It is by far the best community for technology. Um, you got to get the extensions from the marketplace, and it all revolves around GitHub, right? Um, and if you see in Azure Data Studio something you want to add, you can actually go into the GitHub for this. You can propose it right there. If you find a bug, you can pr propose it. And I believe, and I might be wrong, I believe you can go and grab the source code make the change, and then they check it in, and there's an approval process and all that kind of stuff, which I think is very, very cool. Most can be downloaded from the vendor's website, or it is at GitHub, right? Uh, the Redgate one, I had to go to their website to get it. I think Century One, I had to log in to, the Redgate, I had to log in to get it, and I can't remember Century One where I got it. So it varies depending on the product. Now, installing an extension, there's two ways to do it. One is you will download a file and you will download a VSIX file. You'll put it in a place that won't get lost, won't get overwritten, won't get deleted, and then all you do is you go to file, install extension from VSIX file. Now, sometimes when you do that, sometimes you have to restart Azure Data Studio, which is okay because it remembers everything you're doing, right? <laughs> um, so that's not really a problem. Sometimes it, you don't have to do that, right? Sometimes when you uninstall it, you have to restart. Sometimes you don't. It'll tell you if you need to do that. Then sometimes it, you will go and it will just, like some of the Microsoft stuff like this one right here, it'll just download it and grab it and install it. Right? And we'll go into some of these right here. Now, when you go into the marketplace, which will be a window over here, you'll have an option. You just click the install button and it'll tell you where it's at. So how do I get to the marketplace? Well, it's pretty simple. I come over here and show Azure Data Studio. It's right down here, extensions. And I click that. Now there's three groups. You have the enabled, those are the ones that are installed and enabled. You have the recommended, and then you have disabled. These are the ones that are installed but disabled. I'm starting to sound a little like Donald Rumsfeld. We have known knowns. <laughs> um, so we click here and then some documentation pops up. 
or we can go to the recommended. And you notice there's 30 of them. I have 20 installed. There's 30 more that I have not had installed. And I can simply click here and it'll install it. Right? You notice it says it's installing. And what will happen is see it says right here, reload required. Right? So now I need to restart Azure Data Studio. But I can also disable. So if I click this one, I can right click or click on that and disable it. And eventually when I restart it, it'll move it down to the disabled group, right? So you can manage what extensions are active, which ones are not, because maybe you don't need some of them active all the time. You just need them for certain situations, right? Um, so you can decide on which ones you want. But some of them you will see the little green triangle with the star on it. Those are the ones, and this is the actual definition that I've seen at Microsoft. It says these are the ones that are recommended by Azure Data Studio. I'm pretty sure the application's not making the recommendation. I'm probably thinking that that's probably the group, the team, that's going and say, yeah, this is one we want to install, right? Um, so you wanna look at that. Now, you notice there's something here, and I just did a blog post on that. See that number one up there? What that is, that's the Explorer. And we click here, we have one unsaved document open. So as I add files and I open files and I make changes to them, it will tell me how many unsaved documents I have open. It's kind of cool, I like that. So we go back to extension. So that's how you can install in extensions. It's pretty straightforward. It's not terribly complex, right? So now, This is the status I was just talking about. You have three options. You have enable, recommended, disable, and it will move depending on where it's at. If you dis uninstall it, it'll, it'll jump down to the recommended. If you disable it, it'll jump down to disable. It'll move back and forth depending on what you're going to do with it. Now, PowerShell. I like this. I think this is absolutely fantastic that PowerShell is part of this because it was a part of Management Studio. And I love the fact I don't need to switch programs anymore. Now, a while back, I had read some people on Twitter were talking about the performance of PowerShell. And I don't know what ever came of that. It was a release that they did that was causing some performance issues apparently. Um, and so you wanna kind of pay attention to that. Maybe do a Google search on it. I haven't had a chance to do that yet. So PowerShell, we have access to it. You can have a SQL connection and PowerShell window open and the same tool. Instead of two different windows, we can have it in the same tool. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I've liked about Visual Studio Code is they allow you to do some pretty decent uh, Python development. Right. It. Yeah. Do you know if you can do like side by side Python with like the query window? Not here, but you can put Python in notebooks. Okay. Right. Um, but you have to install, like I sat into uh, Chris Hyde's Python Precon, and I used the Anaconda uh, Python. And so you have to go and configure all that. It can't do it by itself, right? And, and what I did with Python, I made the Hello World program. <laughs> I was happy with that. <laughs> and I'm actually a programmer, but that's a completely different world for me. Uh, in, into that. Um, I, I want to learn more about it. And, and if Chris Hyde is anywhere around doing that pre-con on, on Python, uh, attend it. It's absolutely fantastic. Um, so you can do PowerShell as well, which is very, very nice. Now there is an extension in the marketplace for PowerShell. So I can actually, if I come over here and go to Azure Data Studio, let's close the extensions. PowerShell is right here and I open it up and I see all my commandlets. And I see all my commandlets. And I say, here we go. <laughs> all right, and I see all my commandlets. And here's my, my terminal down here. And I can just type uh, whatever, it is, whatever it is I want, right? I love the fact I can do both, right? Um, I don't have to go toggle back and forth anymore. Yeah. Do you add modules to some of the As far as I know, yes. Um, I have not dug that deep into the PowerShell part of it, um, but I believe you st all the same rules apply, right? Um, but I would need to dig deeper to see if that's actually true, but I would assume it would be because it's still PowerShell. Nothing's different. It's still the same thing. It's just being rendered out in this application versus the cooking window. Yeah. Um, 
All right. Uh -oh, so I'm going to close that. So I love the fact that PowerShell is there. Now, let's talk about some of these extensions. You guys have all heard of SP Who's Active, right? right? Most people have used that. There is a dashboard for that. It's an extension download. However, it does not, uh, you still have to have SP Who is Active running on the server that you're connecting to. If it's not, you'll get in there. Right. Then there's this first responder uh, kit extension. It's about by Brent Ozar. Uh, then you have some that are put out by Microsoft, the MSDB Insights and MSQL Instant Insights. And they tell you exactly what they are. One's about database information. The other one's about server information. And then one of my favorite extensions is the poor SQL formatter. I think this thing is awesome. Jake heard me talk about it uh, out at Summit. This thing is so cool. Um, and uh, you'll see that here in a second. So if we come over here and we look at a server, so I want to close the PowerShell window. Let's close this guy. We don't want to save it. Let's close this guy, get rid of that guy. So if we come over here and oh, 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 here we go. You're going to, oh, who is active? So we go to connections. If I right click on a connection and go to manage, and what we'll see is we'll see them as you install the extensions, it'll throw them across the top here as tabs, right? And you look, I have for this connection, I have the home dashboard, which is just giving me some basic information. It has the DB insights, the instant insights, SQL agent, because you, in order to manage jobs here, you got to go get the extension. Uh, server reports, which I'll show you at SP who is active. So if I click SP who is active, and can I displayed with the given data? And I'm not sure what that is, but it does work. <laughs> uh, but I can now and see here some things about SP who is active. So who, who does that? That's um, and a mechanic. So he has allowed somebody, I don't know if he actually wrote the extension, he might have, um, but that is now part of Azure Data Studio. I love that fact. Before that with management studio, you had to go elsewhere to get the visualizations. That's what these are. These are visualizations, right? When they work. Not displaying too much right now, but they do work. They worked this morning when I was going through it. So, but people are watching and so that's, that's probably why. So the next one is DB Insights. Hopefully this will work. So we click here, we go to DB Insights. Hey, look at that, we have some information. So it's giving me about status about my database sessions, resource usage, so it can give me some information about it. But one of the things I really like, some of these visualizations have a little ellipsis at the upper right hand corner. I can run the query. And I run the query. Oh, it ran the query. Or did it? Why did it do that? Is that the query that's apparently executed? Yeah. I don't know what's going on. Do you have anything running? Yeah, everything's sleeping inside. That's yeah, it's probably why it's done. returning nothing. So, um, but then I can also go here, show details. Something's wrong. So something's wrong. I, I don't know why it's doing that. It's because somebody's watching. That's why. Um, so, but I like this. It's not the prettiest of charts, but they're charts that are useful, right? So I can also go to the MS Instance Insight, and it's going to get some information, in this case, virtual log files. How many do I have? Uh, VentureWorks 2014, there's kind of a few of them there. Um, and I kind of have to keep it that way for my pre-con that I do um, when I do that. Um, but it tells me that information, there's nothing with extended system stats, extended events IO stats, there's nothing there, but here's page latch IO. SH weight type, so it gives me information about weights as well. I really like this. It's a nice little dashboard, costs zero dollars, zero time in development, and it gives me something useful. All you have to do is install it, right? These two are from Microsoft, right? So the next one is the poor SQL formatter. I love this one. So of the people here, how many people were born in the first half of the year? First half of the year. Yeah, there we go. 
Wow. So, that was way harder of a question. <laughs> yeah. So if you were born in the first six months of the year, that would be the first half. <laughs> Which year? <laughs> uh, this is the query you need to troubleshoot. If we look at it, it's formatted nicely. You know, we got the selects, things line up. And what I like about it is even Azure Data Studios helped me line things up, right, with these gray lines that are vertical, right? So you're, you're going to have a good day, right? So this would be trouble. This is an actual store procedure, but it didn't look like this when I saw it. So who was born in the second half of the year? That would be the second six months. <laughs> oh, just you? Yeah. Well, I deeply apologize to you, but this is your query that you need to troubleshoot. Yeah, this is actually how it looked when I opened it up. And when I was doing the summit thing, I said I had brown hair until I opened this up, <laughs> right? And, and, and what I like about it is that even Azure Data Studio gave up. See the brown line, the gray lines, it stopped at after line four. They said, I can't, I can't do it anymore, so I'm done, right? So what can I do about it? Well, if I go to view, command palette, and I type the word poor, two of them come up. The one we want is SQL formatter. I click that. And there we go. I think this is a, by far, because I think all the other ones were expected, you know, the, the DB Insights, the Instance Insight, SP, who is active, all that. That was kind of expected, the execution plan from Century One. This was not. I wasn't expecting this. So when I saw this, I, that is cool. Um, because think of how much time you troubleshoot. And I worked at a casino for, for nine years as a DBA. It was $1,500 a minute lost if the system was down. That's a lot of money. And I, anybody been to a casino? Yeah. yeah. Do, do they like losing money? <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. They, they do not like that. So if I had to tell my boss, oh, yeah, the system's got to be down another 10 minutes because I got to figure out what this code is doing, right? That's what? Fifteen or fifteen thousand dollars lost for ten minutes just because you got to decipher the code, right? This is a huge extension. So if you find these store procedures that are like this, grab this guy. Great cost. Yeah, and I, I, I think just just to add to your point, the only tools that I know that do this this well cost money. Right. The same extension so, for it used to be called Four Man's SQL Formatter. Was it? Was it? Was it? Yeah, I haven't hadn't used that before, but I think this thing is phenomenal. Uh, and when I did a blog post on it, it was kind of cool because somebody picked it up and sent it out on their email blast, and then Bryn Ozar put it on his, which I thought was kind of cool. Um, you know, it's always good when you get a, a plug from somebody like Bryn to kind of promote your, your blog a little bit, right? So we already talked about the PowerShell. These are... Uh, extensions that are out by Microsoft and some of them are useful uh, depending on what you're doing like if you do a lot of data warehousing uh, data warehouse insights um, the uh, database administration tool extension for Windows uh, for working directly with Azure Data Studio and um, gives you some of the management studio experiences server reports useful insights about the server related to performance and that last one it's an admin pack there's actually two of them and I Notice I forgot the R on serve, should be a server. Um, but um, the one you want is you want the SQL agent extension. If you install that admin pack, you get it. But there also is an agent extension you can get as well. And the reason I like that is because we come over here and we connect again. And we go to manage. There's no agent over here. So I can't right click, I can't open agent, go look at the, I can't do any of that. So I grab this extension and I click on this and a couple of things that I really like about it. One is over here we talk about there's uh, notebooks, there's alerts, operators, proxies. So that's all still there, right? But what I really like about it is right there, the far right, the five previous runs of that job with a graphical representation. 
And I think that is really cool because I can look and see, is it regressing? Is it getting faster? What is it doing from a performance perspective? Now, if this is a job that runs every five minutes, it's not going to be as as important. But if this is your ETL job that takes three hours every night and all of a sudden, wow, that second one, why did it take six hours? What happened? Right? It's a nice little flag to you to go and look at it. And I really, really like that. Now, <clears throat> there are some things that you can't do. I can still click new job. And I give a name. I have steps. I can assign schedules. What you can't do is you can't create a shared schedule. So you can use them, you just can't create them. So you gotta go into Management Studio to create those there. Now what I haven't tried, but I suspect you probably could do is use Transact SQL to create it, right? I just didn't try it, but I'm assuming that you can do that. You can set up alerts and notifications. This hasn't changed, it's still here. Um, so I can work with jobs, but you're not gonna be able to do that if you don't get the extensions, right? So the next one is server reports. So here is the top 10 DB buffer usage, tempdb. So tempdb is using most of my buffer pool. Uh, MSDB, which makes sense. AdventureWorks, it's not using very much because this isn't a production system, right? So we're not going to see the typical, you know, tempdb may or may not be up at the top, but chances are in your production system, MSDB is not going to be your number two database. It could be, but probably will not be. Um, and so over here, I can get the space. What, space as well. Uh, looks like I got a problem in my log. Right? It's a little bit bigger than the data file. Right? And then I come down here, CP utilization, uh, backup growth trend. I like that. So if I look at this, I can see what's going on with my backups. What was that? It's got to come from backup. Oh yeah, that's exactly where it comes from. Uh, I did a, a um, and if you really want to get details on how this works and Pittsburgh, if you go to SQL Saturday in Pittsburgh this last year, I did a session on how to do a server assessment. And a lot of this is Transact SQL for a lot of these things as part of those assessments that I did, All right? Uh, so I like that, I think that is cool. So I would want to know is why did it go from less than a gig to almost five gigs? What happened? I tell you, I added a bunch of databases, all right? So I really, really like that. So I love the representation side of things with Azure Data Studio. The next thing, we already showed you the Century One ex, uh, Plan Explorer, but you notice these are the three big ones, I think. I mean, there's a few other out there, but there's Century One, Idera, Redgate, um, Quest, I think is another one, but I think these are the three main ones. I've used all three of them, being a friend of Redgate program, um, you know, Redgate. <laughs> As a friend of Redgate, do you know like the SQL prompt work with this? I mean, I know, it's, I know that that costs money normally, so. Um, I think it does, but I don't know for sure. As a friend of Redgate, a lot of times we get an opportunity to review things ahead of time and they ask our opinion on a lot of things. But over the last few months, I just really haven't had much time to really look at it um, because of Summit. And I did three SQL Saturdays in October, I think. So I was kind of busy with that. And you're here tonight. <laughs> and I'm here tonight. And does it have a sense in the, in the prompt? So like when you select, you know, is that functionality? Because that's in Digital Studio and Management Studio. <coughs> The query you talk about select. Yep. So I, I believe in settings you can turn that off just like in Management Studio. Right? Yeah, that doesn't change. That's SQL Server and Postgres. If they work together, um, you know, I. I do know it wasn't Summit this year, it was Summit last year, they did a, a query that pulled data from an Oracle server, a SQL server, and was it a Hadoop big cluster, I think, and they did joins in all three of them put it together. Yeah, with the link server, but different. Yeah, so I think the same rules would apply and that kind of thing. Um, I do know they, they've 
really improved. And I don't know if it's as much about Management Studio as it is the version of SQL you're connected to, right? Um, I think it has more to do with that than yeah. Azure Data Studio. So, uh, no different than you could do before, but you can create visualizations on it. Well, you could do a file, open file or something. Mm -hmm. There's some commands you could use to pull the data in. Um, this is the data visualization. I, and I got a blog post ready for this. I just haven't published it because at Summit I learned some things that I, I want to double check and make sure I was right on. But I really, really like this. And, and the, one of the sessions I went to, and I can't remember who did it, but it was really cool because she got the data set for some county out, west, or out east or something. And it was the most common dog names by dog type, right? So the black lab, the most common name was Smokey. Yeah. Which kind of makes sense. And then she went on to really do something really cool. She used uh, um, analytics to randomly pick a dog name <laughs> based off of the data set. And I thought that was kind of cool. But you can come in here and you can build this. And this is native there, but you can point it to a CSV file too, right? And there's different charts that you can use. These are just examples of two of them. Now, they are making improvements on this. And I'm not a huge visualization person, but I do know that sometimes the, the graph is kind of clunky, right? The data is not what's in the table, right? So you got to look out for those kinds of things. I also found something that when you go to the 3D chart, it never goes back sometimes, and you got to close it and start it up and start over again, which is kind of strange. Um, but it's pretty cool. And it still is extremely valuable. But there's still little gotchas that you got to look out for, right? So jobs in Azure Data Studio, we already talked about this. You got to get the extensions for this. Um, you can get it through the agent or the admin pack extensions, uh, but you can do many same things, create jobs, start jobs, view history, you can do all that kind of stuff. Um, I still think the biggest thing is the visualization of the last five times it ran. I think that is cool. Um, but the BI stack related step types are not available. So when you go to create a, uh, a job in Azure in Management Studio, you can create uh, uh, analysis services query, analysis services command, SSIS package execution. Those are not options here. So you still need to use Transact SQL or you need to go and use Management Studio for them. Um, must use create schedules, can't create shared schedules. Uh, here you got to go to Manage with your use Transact SQL. Um, and then you right click and edit, no different than what you could do in Management Studio. All right? Notebooks. This is cool. <laughs> I think this is one of the coolest things. Now, <clears throat> why would I use a notebook? Um, a perfect example would be a run book of some kind, whether it be DR or uh, maybe building the lab, you know, refreshing the lab environment or something like that. But one of the things that we have is we haven't transitioned over to notebooks yet is that we have what we call a solution document. And so let's say we have a job that fails, right? And that job fails for reason A. So we'll build some documentation. On that. Then it fails for reason B. So rather than create a second document, we just have a nice format where we put it all in one document. So when that job fails, we just go to that one document. So at two o'clock in the morning, you're not digging around looking for files, right? It's right there. So now we could take that and not only put all those notes into the one document, we can also put the executable code needed to fix the problem and actually execute it from the notebook. Whereas before we put the code in the Word document, copy, paste in Management Studio, right? But we can also put in Python. You can put PowerShell in here. Now PowerShell, um, at least my instance, and when you go to try to use the kernel, it locks up. So I don't know if it's something on my box or not. Now when you do this, and these are tied in with the Jupyter Notebooks, which have been, I guess, around for a while, but they will have an IPYNB extension to them. So when you go into notebooks, you go to Azure Data Studio, you can go to uh, file new notebook. But we're not gonna do that. We're actually gonna come here and we're gonna open up this guy. 
this is my second session if I were to make point one. Now, you notice we have some information, then we have some executable code, then we have more information, we have some executable code. But one thing I want to point out here is if we look, the second one contains data. So when you execute it, you can save the data in the notebook. Be very careful because if you send this notebook out and you got your data in it, that could be a problem, right? So be aware that you're saving the data in there. But so when you run the query, right up here, clear result. Make sure you clear it or just simply don't save it. Right, so now we got our note, but if you look, we got some formatting going on here. Well, how do we do that? It's called markdown language. Well, it's a bunch of sharp signs. I call them sharp signs because I'm a musician, but they're pound signs, hashtags, you know, but to me, they're sharp signs. <laughs> um, so if you look, the sharp signs and the asterisks are what are dictating what the font looks like, right? And if we look at my blog right here, it says Dave Bland's blog, but if we look, blog at Dave Bland's blog, what's in the square brackets is what you'll see, what's in the parentheses is the link, right? So you can include links in here as well, and you can change the fonts, sizes, and whether or not it's italics by simply using the asterisks and the pound signs in combination. But you also notice here, you have this little window section kind of thing. That is by this, right? It's that little greater than sign. That's what causes you to get that. So you can actually have really nice formatting in your comments and your notes inside your document, right? So I'm gonna close this up. We'll close it up. Here we got some tiny, tiny, tiny thing. No animals were harmed in the making of this presentation. So we're good, right? So now I have some executable code here. In this case, I'm simply gonna get log space. Um, so I can simply click right here, run cell, and there it is. And that will then save that to the notebook if I save it? If you save it, it'll put this into the notebook, right? I don't know if it compresses it because I didn't really look at what the size of this data is versus the size of the file. It will make the file bigger. I just don't know if it actually compresses it. That's third question. <laughs> um, so I really, really like this. I think this is super cool because I can go through and I can have my uh, if the server goes down or if they, we get a, a text message on memory utilization. Man, everything's right here, right? Not only just the code, but also the uh, text as well, or the, the code as well, code and comments. Now, one of the things, and that they have changed this, is that, and I don't know how they changed it, um, but I thought you could change it because this is a transact SQL. But if I go to run cells, it'll run everything, but you notice down here, I get an error. Why? That's Python, right? So what I have to do is I have to change the kernel. So if I click this and I go to Python, it takes a second to change it and takes a few more seconds and a few more seconds and, and it's not gonna work. And not locked up. Since I updated to the last version, Oh, there it is, just takes longer. Um, now I can execute this Python. I believe you have my stapler. And it runs just fine, right? However, if I run here, what's gonna happen to my T-SQL? Blew up, right? At the focus group I was at, there was a lot of talk on allowing you to set the kernel at each code window. Um, I believe I had the latest window or latest build of it. And I don't know if you could do it. I just updated it the other day. Uh, but be on, on, out on the lookout, be on the lookout for that, um, where you can set it based off of the language for each individual cell, right? That way, when you click run cells, it'll all run in the right thing. Yeah. 
Do I know the answer to the question? Uh, maybe. Oh, okay. Uh, we have not yet. Okay. Uh, I guess I, I was going to answer my question with a yes, but the, I, the, the really the, the question is: Do you have multiple people in the notebook at once editing? Like you can't put one in that document. I don't think so. Okay. I don't think so. Um, and but to go to your first question, we will be because we're, we are big believers in documentation, yeah, sure. and and we are big believers in processes, yeah. right? Um, I don't believe very much in the DBAs. There might be a few of them on, on the online, but uh, I don't believe in ad hoc troubleshooting, right? I like to have things planned out whenever possible. And if it happens once, the next time it happens, I want to make sure we're ready for it through the documentation. So we are going to eventually use this as soon as I can hire some DBAs. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we got a question from the online folks. What's underneath the ellipsis menu on these code windows? So you click this. Yeah. Insert yeah, code before and after. So that's what you see. Mm -hmm. Collapse cell, expand cell, clear results. You can delete it. So uh, I like that. Uh, I like the fact, but be careful of saving data in this document, though. You know, I do DBA work, so this many of much of this is not confidential. But I also work for a company that's publicly traded that deals with medical waste. There's a lot of rules around that kind of stuff and releasing of data and all that kind of stuff. So, and if you work for healthcare or anything that has customers, we're lucky. Most of our customers are companies, not people. Well, you guys may not be that lucky. Where, and I know you because you work for Epic and my sister and sister-in-law both work with Epic. In fact, they're the technical lead at their hospitals for Epic. And uh, that's all about customer information, right? And you can get big, 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 big trouble if that gets out, right? And so I'm, I know at Epic, you guys probably spend a lot of time on how can you protect this data. And also just a lot of stuff you didn't expect is protecting information that it is. It can just be things like, Patient identification numbers. Yeah. So you gotta be just real careful. Well, also, I, I think just a little side note on, on that if you can back into the data, that is, you've released information, yes. right? And, and I think sometimes we forget about that. We, we focus a lot on we can't give birthdays. But if we can back into the data with the data you did give, that was a problem. When I was at the casino, I used to, I, I actually got mad at the Illinois Gaming Board. Why? Because we had a badge. What was on the badge? Our birthday, our picture, our name, and in the back was a barcode with our social security number. <laughs> it's like, serious, if we lose that, that's pretty much everything you need, right? <laughs> so fortunately, they eventually changed that. It just took a little while to change. So, but one of the things you want to point out, you notice I get the number one up to two? Because I have two unsaved documents open now. So there's all these little notifiers inside Azure Data Studio. If you have a, an extension that has an update, you'll see a number there, right? So you'll see this thing, and it, it's really good at telling you. Now, if there's a new version of Azure Data Studio available, you'll see it here. Right? It'll pop up on this little wheel on the side. So it'll pop up right here. And you can change the color theme. Uh, and I actually like this because I like to do this. Mm. Right. The only reason I have it the other way because I was told it's easier to read when I'm presenting. So, um, so notebooks is very, very cool. I really, really like that. So what should I do? So we've got this cool new tool and we've still got the cool management studio available. So what do we do? It's pretty simple, install them both, right? And then what you guys need to do is at your companies is figure out what do you want to have everybody to have as far as extensions, right? We've had a few conversations about uh, what we want to have, but these are the ones I think we should install. Admin pack, DB insights, in instance insights, PowerShell, Century One Plan Explorer, and server reports. I think minimum we should have that. But I wrote this before I found out about the poor SQL formatter. So that would be one I would include there. So just come up with a standard of what you should have. 
but also there's always new ones coming out, right? So be aware and always be checking them out because there's some really, really cool stuff happening. Yeah. So with that in mind, let's say you have a template you want to deploy to your company. Mm -hmm. Is there a way that you can say, all right, click on this and it's going to install all the extensions that you have to go out one by one to the marketplace and download? I wonder if System Center can do that. I, I don't know. Um, well, you, you could always uh, tell everybody that this is what you got to do, and if um, they don't do it, put Chia Pet on their keyboard. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, and thank you very much. Hopefully, if you learned a lot, um, this is some cool stuff. It really is. So. Questions for today that we didn't already get? So you got my email at, oh, I didn't, on my blog is my email address. Feel free to shoot me off an email if you got questions. And these guys also got my email address. You guys are welcome to give it up. great praise from the people online. Thanks and applause emojis. Yeah. <laughs> so. They all work for me. Uh, not at this point, no, um, because you can't even create a job that runs uh, analysis services commands. So I, I don't see that at this point. I mean, that could change. No, I think it's aimed at um, because the it depends on where you're at. Like a lot of the stuff we would do for for the BI stack, only the DBAs could do. So it depends on where you're at because of separation of duties. Right. So if you're SOX, your developers can't do that kind of stuff anyway. So I don't think it's necessarily targeted for um, a particular group of people, but I think how you can take a single computer and configure it for a single type of person, whether a BI developer or a DBA or an analyst, is dictated by the extensions you install. Yep. We got a question online. Uh, does this connect to Azure Synapse? Or whatever that is. <laughs> Do you the brain stuff? It'll connect to, well, if it's an Azure VM, it'll connect to that because that's just a normal instance. It will connect to an Azure SQL DB. It'll connect to an Azure Data Warehouse as well. Uh, just be careful creating an Azure Data Warehouse because I instead inst attended a pre-con in Iowa and I created, I went into Azure and I created the Azure uh, data warehouse costs a hundred bucks just to create it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I did not tell my wife about that. <laughs> <laughs> hundred bucks just to create. Why? It took about two and a half to three hours. It was all the compute to create the, because all the other stuff around the warehouse that is needed. So if you do that, just be careful. Isn't there use case effectively that Azure SQL data warehouse? We haven't seen a client that's big enough to. I haven't. Um, yeah, yeah, because you work with a lot of different companies, so. Yeah, no, I, I, in terms of it on the cloud, it's biggest component from compared to Snowflake. I mm -hmm. see a lot of people in Snowflake. Yeah. So I, and I work with personal, I often, I often tell people the cloud is, is incredibly expensive unless you're right on top, like on top of it. Yeah, and you also have, if you're going to go to Azure or AWS or whatever, you have to have rock solid cost management processes in place um, because otherwise you could end up with a pretty large bill if you're not careful. And, and one of the things I think that can kind of catch people off guard is I think they know how the billing goes, but Microsoft's always changing it. And just like anything else, the billing process is a little complex as well. So if you've moved to Azure, you got to understand how they bill you on that as that compute that I think can get um, you the most. I did a blog post on because they can also get you for data coming out, right? So I created a, an Azure SQL DB and inside Azure, there's an Azure query editor, right? It's like management studio in Azure. And I was curious if it would cause the egress to go up and, because it's going from Azure to Azure, it did. So I was a little surprised by that. No, that was a very small sample. 
Um, but I was a little surprised because it was in the same region. And I still kind of, my egress went up. Whether that equates it to actual additional cost, I didn't get billed for it. Um, but that's because of my Azure, the way it's set up. So um, you got to be very careful on those costs. They can come back to hurt you very quickly. So, any other questions? How was the beer? <laughs> <laughs> hey, what was it you're drinking there? What was that? Big wave. Big wave? Wisconsin right, beer? Again, Dave. Yeah. Sure. That was awesome.